Now the section you're looking at here, this detail of the floor area, um, is a, a document of a painting that Pollock worked on over quite a long period. He originally painted it in 1951, and it was just black paint on an unprimed canvas, so it was a very monochromatic picture. But in 1952, he went back to it and added color to it. And he evidently experimented with the colors, just um, mixing them up a little bit to see what they would look like before he put them on the canvas. And that's the evidence that we have here. That painting is called Convergence, and it's in the Albright Knox Art Gallery in Buffalo. It came to New York most recently, a couple of years ago, to a show at the Jewish Museum, but it's on pretty much permanent display at the uh, Albright Knox. We have some colors also from a, a painting called Blue Poles, which was painted around the same time. And Blue Poles and Convergence are the last two large canvases that Pollock did on this floor before it was covered in the 1953 renovation. So let's turn the camera around over here, and you'll see some bright orange and some silver, it's actually aluminum radiator paint, and those colors are from uh, blue poles. Uh, you'll also see some ultramarine blue, some spots of ultramarine blue on the floor, and the can of ultramarine paint that we still have in the uh, display of Pollock's material. The other large canvas that Pollock worked on uh, before the, just before the floor was covered in 53 is known as Blue Poles. And it contains the orange that you see on the floor here, the aluminum radiator paint, the very bright silver color, and also these ultramarine blue speckles or, or spots where the pole, there was an actual two by four that was used as a guide to make these vertical marks on the canvas. And these spots are here, and here, and several others along that row, and those are evidence of the poles themselves. That painting is in the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra. And the last time it came to New York was for Pollock's retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art in 1998. I don't know when it will be back, but it is definitely there in Canberra, and it caused a lot of controversy when it was purchased by the Australian government for $2 million American in 1950, uh, no, sorry, 1973. And it was at that time the highest price ever paid for an, an American painting, and it was really uh, extremely controversial. And it's still uh, a very highly debated picture because of its extreme size and its extreme price. The studio display includes photographs and text panels that talk about Pollock and Krasner's lives and careers, and also a case that contains some of Pollock's materials. He famously used house paint instead of ordinary artist material, although he did use two pigments as well, and also found objects and um, incidentals that he would add to the paintings. So they do contain a lot of different materials, but he favored this house paint, not because it was inexpensive, or even because it was so radically different from what other people were doing. It was just that it gave him the effect that he wanted. He wanted these long flowing lines and house paint is very viscous and also when, when you thin artist pigment it loses its color and consistency, it gets watery looking. But this stuff is, is nice and fluid and still very intense in color. So it solved the problem for him of getting this very, very flowing line without losing the intensity of the, of the color and it's very adaptable, very um, Oh, you can make all kinds of different effects with it. And that was something that he was after. He liked a lot of variety in the imagery. And you'll see that no two Pollock paintings are alike. He never repeated himself. And he always used these interesting materials and used them in interesting ways to get a great variety of different effects. This photograph was taken here in the studio in the spring of 1949 by Arnold Newman, who was photographing Pollock for an article that appeared in Life magazine in August of that year. 
This picture was not run in the magazine, but, and it was originally a color photograph, but it showed Pollock with some of the materials and tools that he used. And it shows you kind of the emotional intensity that he was working with. A lot of the pictures of Pollock do show him looking uh, rather glum and scowling a bit. We also have lots of pictures of him smiling and even laughing. It's not like he uh, didn't have those emotions. But when he was working, he was very focused, very intense, very concentrated. And in fact, when people took pictures of him at work, including Martha Holmes, who photographed him for Life magazine as well, and also Hans Namath, both of them told me that he wasn't even aware of their presence. He completely ignored them. Martha said he didn't even know I was in the room. So he was very, very focused on his work because he was bringing it up from inside of himself. He wasn't observing the outside world and then trying to illustrate or depict it. He was trying to get in touch with his emotions and his own responses to the stimuli that he felt. So it was a process that went on basically inside him. It was an internal thing. And then he had to find a way of making that imagery evident uh, in a graphic way. So for him, the material, the, the, uh, whatever it was he was using, was a means to an end. In fact, he said himself, technique is just a means of arriving at a statement. After Jackson died, Lee took over the Barnes studio, and she worked in this space for almost 28 years. So, as you can see from this photograph, she liked to tack her canvases and drawings up on the wall, and a lot of her work was also very spontaneous, although she didn't really use liquid paint uh, anything like as much as Pollock did because she's working vertically. And so she would use brushes and more conventional methods of making the imagery. But her imagery came from essentially the same place. It came from internal stimuli. But she used a lot of nature references. And you can see in some of the pictures uh, shapes and, and forms that look like plants or seeds or flowers or leaves, something that derives from the natural world without being literal. In this photograph, uh, she is using the same uh, materials and, and the same cart that we have on display in the studio today. These photographs uh, by Mark Pataki, taken in 1969, show Lee at work here in the studio. Krasner liked to um, respond to the work as it progressed. In fact, the way she described this process, she said that she would start by making some brush strokes across the entire canvas, and then something will suggest itself to me, and then I go on with that. So it was a, uh, a cumulative process. The image would, would develop over time. And she was one of those people who always went back into her work. She would redo it, re-edit it, sometimes tear it up or cut it up and make collages out of it. She just was constantly coming up with new ideas and new approaches so that she often was not satisfied with her previous work and she would just kind of cannibalize it. But it made for some absolutely fascinating images because they're so rich and so full of all these revisions and even in the collages you can kind of look be below the surface and see the earlier images coming through. So they have a real visual fascination and just a, a, a very, very intriguing process. If you think these photographs look blurred, that's because they are. They show Lee in action. Like Jackson, she was an action painter, and she painted with a full body motion. So she wasn't just using her arm or her hand. She was really putting herself and her energy into the work. <laughs> 